this so to just introduce uh, about myself so i'm just not going to read much stuff you can just have a quick look so i am a master student and uh, security researcher at uh, carnegie mellon my major is uh, information security Now, the main reason for keeping carnegie mellon in quotes you know that the name carnegie mellon adds so much to you and our university is actually ashwan for information security so i wrote a book and have done quite some other stuff in information security so i've been doing appsec for quite like past 4 5 years appsec network not much network system and other stuff but from past 6 to 7 months is when i found this container security field very interesting and i am actually doing a lot of active research on this uh so coming to my uh, experience with docker container so i have been uh, doing as i said uh, active research with uh, renowned professors from past 20 to 25 days i'm not in much touch i'm doing other stuff but i'm actually going to continue my research again from the next week so i also worked as a cloud security research intern at adobe where we are researching at uh, the container security and also going to provide recommendations to the container security container platform that adobe is actually building so apart from that uh, so uh, one more thing is uh, cis docker 1.12 uh, benchmark i co-authored it with a few other people from ncc vmware and others uh, so you'll find uh, most of the points or i would say few points from that in this presentation it's not actually the cis benchmark is not actually a replication of this presentation it's a totally different thing but you'll find few points uh, of that over here so i also uh, might be working with this year cert as a research intern on container security from uh, next month or so and then uh, that's it about uh, my introduction so before we actually jump into the topic i first want to ask few pre uh, pre questions how many of you actually use no how many of you know what containers are okay pretty good how many of you guys use containers for personal use and for enterprise awesome yeah and uh, so in enterprise do you guys use it for development or else production anyone yes both okay who use it only for development okay and uh, who are the guys are very much interested in containers but are still waiting to use it in development or production just because of security concerns anyone okay i was actually speaking to one guy uh, while i was uh, moving around so he actually told me that i, I asked the, i asked him whether do they use docker containers or something the first answer he gave me was no docker is not secure we don't use it so i, I was kind of little surprised with that yeah th there are security issues but yes we can actually do mitigate mo most of them and make our uh, docker ecosystem secure that's what we'll be talking about stuff today and uh, then so this is actually our agenda for today so i'll be uh, and one more thing if you have any question uh, in between you can just raise your hand and ask me if you can stop that question till the end where i have like 5 to 10 minutes of q and a you can stop it or else if you think that you cannot understand the rest part of what i am explaining if you don't get a clarity on that feel free to raise your hand okay so this is our actual agenda for today so i'll just as many of you have raised hands that you know containers and all that stuff but i found few people who didn't actually raise a hand so i'll just take one minute to quickly uh, do a dive on uh, what containers are and introduction stuff and then we'll be looking at uh, the security part each component of uh, the containers how actually it works and all that stuff and also apart from that we'll be seeing like a holistic view of entire container pipeline what are the risk areas what are the things that you should actually take care of and all that stuff and the few tips future and all uh, the the miscellaneous things so i actually have so much stuff to explain so i'll actually be uh, moving a little fast but if you guys feel that i'm actually going out of your head or something just feel free to raise your hand so that i'll stop and explain uh so just as i said uh, just uh, giving a brief overview of what containers or something so this is the difference between virtual machines and containers so here if you see virtual machines or like you have individual os for each of them but containers you don't have uh, individual os so it's like application centric containers are application centric they share the kernel i actually cannot see from here 
I'm not sure if I'm pointing to the right one and over here it's like very small. So if I'm pointing to a wrong one, please just try to understand. I think this is Docker engine, right? Yeah, so they, no, that's not Docker engine. That's the OS where the kernel, they, they share the common kernel and on top of that, containers uh, build on top of that. So that's the main difference between containers and virtual machines. And uh, coming to the next thing, uh, so the major use cases for containers are like, they're, they're really lightweight. I mean, so if you, there's stats released by IBM Watson Research Center and a few other people where they said like, you can run 4x or 5x times or even more times of containers than virtual machines on a machine uh, uh, having a particular amount of RAM and uh, other configs. So they're uh, really lightweight. So you understand that the reason being that there is a common kernel which every container shares, but in the virtual machine, you have to package every particular thing. So the main, th that's the whole thing. So they're really lightweight and containers are actually meant for application centric and it's also like no more. So you guys know pretty much about it, so I'm not gonna spend too much about it. So it's all about microservices again. So one more, the basic building blocks for containers are namespaces and C groups. Namespaces are actually a kind of view isolation. So say something like a process namespace, PID namespace is nothing but a container in a particular thing, particular process namespace will not be able to see process namespace, uh, processes of other container. So it's kind of an isolation uh, view for entire process, UTS, file, network, and all that stuff. And C groups are the ones which do limitation. So say lim uh, limiting accounting, resourcing kind of stuff. So say something like how much CPU each com container is using, how much memory each container is using. So those are the two basic building blocks for containers. And actually, so if we actually have to say like, or containers brand new buzz, you know, they have been from quite some long time, like a decade or so. Uh, it actually started from uh, CH root, where it's quite very long back actually. And after that, uh, there's been like uh, jails, Sway servers and all that stuff and LXC and LXC after that. Docker and after Docker rocket. So they have been quiet from long time, but the only reason why people are using containers these days pretty much is that because of the Docker. Docker made the ecosystem very easy, such a way that everyone can use it uh, uh, in a very simplified way. So that's the reason containers have become uh, very buzzed these days. Wherever you go, Docker containers, Docker containers. And other container technologies didn't gain much recognition so far, but Docker is one of the ones that uh, actually gained uh, so much, and that's the reason I'm actually concentrating on Docker today. So coming to the environment, actually, so this is the particular container environment. So this is specific to Docker, but the same core concepts generally apply to other container ecosystems too. So if you see how container pipeline actually exists, or how the workflow starts from container uh, for right from the starting till the beginning and all that. So you can see here, client. <coughs> I'm sorry. So you can see here, client is the one where you actually issue the commands, docker pull, push, or whatever it is. And docker host is the one where you have the entire uh, diamond, which takes care of managing the containers and images and all that stuff. And then, so people generally for personal use, they keep Docker diamond and the Docker client on the same host, but at enterprise level, they do segregate it on different hosts. And this is a Docker hub where people get images. And this is the same hub kind of thing, but a private thing. So diamond keeps contact with Docker hub to get the images. and. Uh, Images are actually spinned to containers. So this is how the workflow starts. Client issues a command and then it goes to Diamond and then Diamond, if needed, goes and gets the images from Docker Hub or else a private registry and then keeps everything managing here. So this is the environment that uh, a container pipeline will actually be having. So now, basing on what you see the container pipeline now, what do you think are the risk areas here? Anyone? So the quicker you answer, the more I can cover. So perfect. That's 
Awesome. Yeah, that's one point. And others? Oh, good. Yeah, that's one thing. And yeah, and what are the risk areas do you guys see? Yeah, good. So that all comes under images security section. Yeah. Yet, yeah. So apart from images and uh, and any registries and all that stuff, any other things that you can see or say out? Oh, good. Yeah. And yeah, correct. That comes the concept of shared kernel where you can actually put that point. But yeah, that's a good valid point. Okay. So uh, without, uh, let me just. <coughs> Go ahead and say how I actually see the risk areas. What kind of risk areas do you find and how do you actually need to concentrate them? So images is one risk areas, as you guys said. And other thing is the container runtime. What act, what things might happen when you're doing, when the containers are in action. And the other thing is the diamond itself, which is running the containers. And the other one is the host system, where you're running your containers. And the other one is kernel or uh, containers isolation, as uh, she rightly pointed that. The point is about the shared kernel concept. And the other one comes about the communication between the diamond and the client, and the diamond and the registries. So these are the major risk areas that you can figure out on a high level. The sockets and all that come either in one of these categories. So mostly these are the ones, uh, the uh, high level risk areas that uh, you'll be seeing at uh, Docker. So now the same image that I have shown earlier, I just made it uh, a little more elaborative so that you can figure out uh, uh, a little more details about it. So these are the ones that we actually need to concentrate. These are the pain points. So these are the risk areas that we need to take care in our container ecosystem. So the client itself. So now if you see here, the client itself, this client should have some hardening controls. I'll be talking more about that when we come exactly into that host security segment. And also the diamond itself, the diamond which is managing the containers, images, and all that stuff. And the communication between the diamond and the client, and the diamond and sorry, the diamond and the client, and the diamond and the registries itself, and the security of the images itself, the security of the containers itself, and the security of the registries overall. So these are the pain points. So these are the areas that we actually need to concentrate on. So now this is much about introduction to what container ecosystem is and what are the pain points and uh, all that stuff. So we'll actually be jumping now to the security part. Uh, before I actually go into that, so there are a few things that I'd like to say. Uh, the abstract that you saw on the website, you'll be seeing the entire part that I've mentioned over there, each and everything in this presentation, but it's not going to be a single strike by strike way. So the same way the abstract is written, you cannot see the slides in the same order. So it's all scrambled up in between, basing on the ecosystem that I talked about. So I kept all images at one part, runtime at one part. So at the end of the presentation, you'll be seeing all the topics over there, but they are like little scrambled ahead. So uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, thing that would I uh, like to share. Like this is the past what actual people used to say is like containers do not contain or else they say like uh, they're not secure and all this kind of stuff so there is one stats i think it's released by forester research team so they said uh, some x percent i think it's 53 percent of the decision makers are worried about uh, the security of the containers as the same person whom i spoke earlier he said containers are not docker or uh, docker is not secure so we don't use that so that's actually kind of past and uh, so containers are actually production ready now. So if you see Docker has done a lot of development in security stuff, I do not say it's 100% secure, and that's the whole reason I'm giving this talk today. So uh, they, they have done a lot of stuff, and they're actually production ready now. So Google itself spends so many containers, I, I think 2 billion containers per week or so. So and coming to the future, containers are actually the future. People are actually migrating to containers. They are like okay we'll move to the containers so it's all about microservices and i get easy lightweight deployments and all that stuff okay so this is the uh, one uh, goal of this presentation so docker says on their official website that they are secure by default 
And NCC group report on containers says that Docker default security settings are quite good. By the end of this presentation, I, I, I'm still saying it now, by the end of this presentation, even you guys will agree that Docker is not secure by default. You have to do a lot of security settings so that you can make it secure. So th this uh, is one of the main goal uh, that we'll be see seeing. And one of my main approach for uh, explanation, as I said, I divided each into different components, images, runtime, host, diamond, and all that stuff. So we'll be dealing about how each thing can be broken and how each thing can be secured. So my approach for this explanation is like, I initially thought of explaining only a single particular thing and go in depth into that. But rather than that, I thought that I'll just give a broad idea about each segment and refer people to a particular uh, resource where they can go and find more details about it. So I'm actually doing a particular pain point. What would have, uh, what would you have done such a way that it would have been broken? and how you can actually fix that. That is what we'll be seeing today. So over the slides, I have the entire details about what are the pain points and what are the things that you need to take care. And I'll be explaining like, how would you actually would have broken that and how you can actually secure that. So this is the kind of approach that I'll be dealing today. And so coming, the main pain point that we first talked about is uh, the images. So let's talk about uh, images. So Docker images, before going into the security segment of the Docker images, I am actually going to give uh, a brief idea about what images are, how they actually work, and all that stuff. So Docker images work on a layer basis. So they have individual layers. They use uh, a, a union file system model, so where everything works on a layer basis. And the top one that you see over here uh, is uh, the thin writable layer. So how it actually works is like, this is a container, this is a container, this is a container, they have a shared kernel. All of them use the same shared kernel. And now if I do some changes, I have a thin writable layer for my container, which, which it actually works on copy on write uh, model. So the changes that I do for that particular container will be only uh, saved on that top layer for that container. So each container have their own layers with all the changes that they have done, but the shared kernel thing still remains the same. That is how uh, uh, containers uh, images layer thing works. So this is the life cycle. You just write the Docker file and then build the image and then uh, uh, you spin up to a container. So you'll find something called manifest. Manifest file is nothing but where you have the individual details of the entire uh, images. So what, sorry, individual details of the entire layers of a particular image. Now coming to the question, where do you get images from? Any quick answer, please? Where do you get Docker images from? Registry, private or public or what's that? I, I mean, so when I ask the question, who used Docker, many people raise their hands. But now, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Hub and any other source? That's good, yeah. So people generally use Hub, and few people are also using their private registries. And Docker has, uh, uh, not very recently, but yeah, not so old also. They released something called Docker Private Store, where they have enterprise level uh, uh, images and kind of more secure. I didn't explore more on that, but yeah, it's on my task list to explore more on that. So can I use these images directly? That is the question that we should be talking. Yes, people say maybe yes, we can use it, but no. I'll say the reason why you should not actually be using that and alternate sources where you can get images from and all that stuff. So the main reason why you cannot or why you should not use Docker Hub images at least. So Docker Hub is like a place where you have images, general images, official images, general images or the it's same like App Store where you have everyone publishing or Android, everyone publishing their uh, apps and all that stuff. So Docker has official images which Docker itself publishes and the general images which either you, me or anyone else can publish into that. So general images are the ones which are published by other people and Docker has something called uh, Nautilus which is also called as Docker security scanning. So they scan these images and try to figure out vulnerabilities, what kind of vulnerabilities are present and all that stuff. They do this scanning at least on the official images, but general images are untouched. So it's not good to use general images at all, at least for enterprise use. And for personal use, maybe if it's not that crucial, yes, but you always 
it's not security proof like it's not like uh, any vulnerability proof or something you have a lot of security issues if you use that and as i said uh, docker private store is one which i didn't explore much uh, i got the beta invite approval just few days back uh, i think they started rolling out very recently and then uh, i got to actually see this what's the Scanned with. <coughs> okay, as I said, they are not actually sc uh, scanned with Nautilus. Official images are scanned, but not the general images. Now, the main reason why I am actually saying that we should not be using uh, general images or for enterprise use at least is that so. This is these are the quick results from a report called uh, Banyanok. So they have released a report in which they said. 30% of uh, official images are vulnerable and 70% general images are vulnerable. So they have a lot of vulnerabilities. And this is a report in 2015 that was made. And few pack few highly vulnerable packages are like, I think, OpenSSL, uh, Mercurial, and I think Bash, Apt. These are the most vulnerable packages that they found uh, in the images. So this is a 2015 report after that Docker started releasing Nautilus or Docker security scanning and trying to figure out the vulnerabilities and work with the vendors to fix them. But still there are, as I said, general images are still not touched. It's all the work that's going on with official images only. So Docker images are not actually quite uh, ready. And one more thing, as I said, uh, I have done some analysis on images. So I just downloaded a few images and started analyzing. So the first image that I downloaded is something like Docker UI. And then I started doing it. Within just one minute, I found there is XSS vulnerability in that. I, I'm being frank. The first image, I just downloaded it. And within two minutes, I figured out it's as an XSS vulnerability. And then I started doing the image security analysis with a tool called Twistlock, where I found many vulnerabilities with few uh, packages, even in the official packages itself also. So there is vulnerable Tor version, Glipsy version, Apache version and all that. So this is kind of proof that I gave in another presentation, but it's not much of interest. What we actually need to know from this is that Docker images, at least the general images, are not for enterprise use. Even for personal use, maybe if you are security uh, very careful, you should not actually be using them. Even official images, you have to be taking care of few things, which I'll be telling now. Question. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, coming in the next slides. Yeah, let me know. So this is the thing that we learn now. So one core point that we should not be using Docker Hub images, at least for the enterprise use. Okay. So now I said this is the problem. Then what is the solution? What should I actually be doing for solving this particular problem? Well, yes, you can do a few things. You can make your own uh, Docker images in a secure way and host it at your enterprises. This is what. Uh, 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 we are actually doing it. I'm actually suggesting for a few enterprises too. So the two things that you need to concentrate under this segment. Point number one, you need to concentrate is how you should securely, as you know, the Docker file, Docker uh, flow works like this. Docker file, image, and then the container. So the flow works like this. And if you see, you have to start taking care of security at the Docker file itself. While you write the Docker file, there are a lot of security mishaps that you can do, which we'll be seeing now. And after you write the Docker file and you build the images, there are other security constraints that you have to take care, without which you can't maintain the images securely. So those are the two things. Now coming to the first particular thing, like how we can actually write Docker file securely. So this is where I'm talking about a particular point. All the work that I have done and a few other people have done in the security segment, they have actually inputted everything into the CIS Docker benchmark 1.12. It's the latest one. You'll find a lot of very useful information over that. So you can tune it as per your organizational requirements and use it. So one particular point is like use version pinning mechanisms for base images and packages. So the main reason here is uh, version pinning mechanisms is nothing but when are you having an image, you say image 1.2, image 1.3, image 1.5, image latest or something like that. The main reason why we are suggesting to use version pinning mechanisms is like Docker has an issue that if I download image latest, uh, say something like there is an image for which the tag is latest. The image latest, I just pulled it and I have it locally on my machine. And when I'm doing a pull again, so the one other guy has updated the image latest and he kept the same tag again, but he updated it. 
Docker allows that. Few registries like npm and other do not allow it. Docker, uh, Docker Hub allows it. So I have an image latest. I did download it. Someone, the same guy replaces that. Again, keeps the same tag as image, lat image latest. Now, when I do a pull again, because I already have the image latest on my base machine, it won't get the latest version. You will still have the vulnerable version on your machine. But if you do a version pinning mechanism like 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1 now whenever the guy updates, he'll be pushing 1.4. Earlier is 1.3. So now, earlier I'll be pulling 1.3, next time I'll be pulling 1.4. So this is one security issue that many people are not aware of. They'll be getting the cached local vulnerable copies. So if you didn't use this, as I said, the break would be like you'll be getting the vulnerable cached local copies. And the fix would be like you can actually use uh, the version pinning mechanisms for uh, solving this problem. And the other thing is like while you're downloading packages in your Docker files, use secure mechanisms like GPG and all that stuff. If you don't use it, you'll be vulnerable to MITM attacks in between where the packages are being downloaded to your machine. So if you use GPG mechanisms, you can verify whether the packages are downloaded properly or not. And few other thing is like, as everyone know, people say that containers by default run as a root. And that's one very big security concern. So you, if you run containers as a root, you're actually giving so much privilege to them. And if you're not enabling user namespaces, you are actually making a container root as the host root itself. So it's a very big security violation. So if you create a user while you're building Dockerfile itself, what actually happens is that the particular container will run as that particular user only. So there will not be privilege, uh, uh, there, there will not be violation of uh, least privilege principle. So uh, you can see the, each point I'm mentioning over there, you can go and get more in details about all of them in the CS Docker benchmark. And the other thing is like, do not update instructions alone. Do not write update instructions alone in the Docker file. So I started explaining this to the CIS team, everyone started uh, saying that this is not a thing that we should be worried about and all that stuff. But then I finally convinced them. So the problem is that now if I write a something on, in Dockerfile saying an update instruction line, app get update or something, how Dockerfile works is like every particular line will form a, every, uh, a particular layer. So now I write app get update x, y, z. So it will form a layer. Now when I write app get update again sometime, when I'm using app get update again, sometime at the later build, it will get the same cached update layer that is there on the machine. So in the earlier build process, there is a cached layer that is, uh, the app get update layer that is cached. Next time also I'll be getting the same thing. I'll not be getting the latest updates from the repository, but I'll be getting the cached local copy of the entire update. So you are actually not getting the entire updates and you'll still be using the vulnerable copies. So that's one thing you should be careful about. And set UID, set GID permissions are the ones that you need to remove. You can remove this at the image level itself while, uh, uh, while you're building the Docker file so that you'll not be vulnerable to privilege escalation kind of attacks. So you'll find the scripts and all that stuff. How do we remove that and all that in uh, the CIS benchmark? And it's the, I'm not talking much about the general uh, uh, rules. It's about increased attack surface. The more you install, the more you have uh, the attack surface. And uh, do not write secrets in the Docker file. This is one very interesting thing. So I think there is one incident in Twitter. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about that, where they have kept their environment variables. Uh, they have kept their secrets in environment variables in the Docker file. So anyone who gets your image will be able to see the Docker file just by doing a Docker inspect of a particular image, or uh, just by doing a Docker history of a particular image. He will be getting the entire Docker file itself. If, and if you store your secrets in the Docker file he'll be able to see the entire secrets. So that's what people do. They pass secrets in environment variables and they write the environment variables in uh, the Docker file. That's actually a very big security thing. So now people might ask me, what do I do then? So maybe good, you have to use some solutions like Keyways, Vault, which allow you to do uh, secure uh, sharing of uh, uh, environment variables. And uh, coming to the next thing is about copy instead of add. So this is one uh, pretty minor thing, but uh, really crucial. What actually copy does is it copies a particular package from your host machine to the build process where you're doing it. And add does download a particular package, unzip it, and then extracts it or something like that, and then pushes it into the image. This way, 
you have multiple issues like what if the remote package that you're downloading is vulnerable and what if the extraction process is vulnerable and all that you are actually getting an additional security overhead which you need to take care of but if you use copy you download it and you do all your uh, task manually and then you push it but if you use add you are not getting the chance of doing all that stuff it downloads and then extracts and then directly goes into the images so prefer to use uh, copy instead of add and health check command is like again minor thing you'll get to know much uh, health check details about uh, docker and go through this is also a generic thing i'm gen uh, i'm actually skipping few generic topics <coughs> which are pretty implicitly understandable so now this is how we actually write docker file securely now comes okay i write the docker file securely and i have the images properly on my machine what do i need to do for maintaining my images securely first thing enable docker content trust docker content trust is an excellent thing i worked on it for almost one month understanding the framework and all that it, trust me it's not easy it's a little complex framework it took quite some time for me to understand that so it is based on a framework called thandi framework which tor used for uh, update systems so this ensures freshness integrity confidentiality guarantees to images if you don't use this docker content rest you are vulnerable to lot of attacks at least in the enterprise level many people started using docker content rest it's really 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 important so it ensures the three crucial properties for images which are not ensured so say something like if i don't have docker content rest enabled and on my registry attacker jumps into registry and then he does changes to the layers or the manifest file or something and then i do a docker pull next time my machine will not be able to detect that the integrity violations if someone modifies or tampers the image my machine will not be able to detect that and if i enable docker content rest my machine will be able to detect any kind of modifications and it will know whether the image is coming from the person whom he actually said he is so this is a very complex framework you have to work a lot on that and you have to build something called your own notary setup your own certificates your own uh, keys and all that stuff so you have to go a little more in depth into that so uh, i have a presentation which i gave at adobe i'll see if i can post it or you guys can reach out to me if you are interested in more details about it so how do we do uh, a notary setup at an enterprise level and all that stuff so this is very crucial important thing using this will provide all the guarantees that uh, uh, i mentioned over there and the other thing is you should be maintaining these images vulnerability free and do a frequent scanning things maybe tools like twistlock nutless klock or aqua so these kind of tools allows you to scan images so one more thing you need to be very careful about uh, scanning mechanism is like uh, few tools just what do they do is like they scan the image and they figure out okay they just write tar iphone iphone version and the output that they get they match it against the database that they have it's just a simple source code thing i can change the source code recompile it and make it uh, output a different version number not vulnerable version number there are tools who actually do that so while you are uh, doing any analysis tools for image analysis and all that you have to specifically ask your vendors for this thing how do you scan images for vulnerabilities do you do a binary level search which netless does or do you do a hash level based comparison which tools like uh, i think twistlock or uh, scalock does so you have to be very specific about this or else if you just do a version string comparison thing anyone can definitely change that and uh, do that stuff so uh, up to date and uh, docker benchmark are general points so before i jump into container runtime i would actually uh pause on for a minute uh, if you guys have any questions or else we can go ahead and start run time yes so Uh, so you say even we have access control strictly do we need content trust or no no i mean uh, what access control do you mean in this scenario in case of containers what access control do you mean
to the registry itself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, there, there are always workarounds for this, but I would say, I would see this scenario in this way. So you have a vulnerable component here, and what you are saying is that I'll keep this vulnerable, and then I'll secure my entire perimeter. This is not what actually security principle works. So security principle says like you don't keep anything vulnerable itself. So even though you keep something hard security controls or something around the registry so that people cannot access it or do any changes or something, what if one day people come, uh, someone is uh, someone managed to get into the registry? It's just a kind of defense in depth measure. So tampering images is one thing that maybe people can. Uh, Prevent it. How about the confidentiality? How do you achieve the confidentiality in an access control environment? How do you achieve the freshness guarantees in an access control environment? Yeah, I got you, but I, I, I would say, I mean, my personal suggestion, I, being a security guy, would always believe this. I don't want to keep anything vulnerable and uh, do an additional way, such a way that I don't need to work around that, but I'll do a work around around that. I would feel like I don't want to need, uh, I don't want to keep anything vulnerable. I would just patch that rather than doing an additional security controls. So in this scenario, Docker content rest, it would take quite some time for you to set up all this stuff. But as you said, if you're doing a very uh, restricted enterprise level, say something like only between me and a particular machine, no one else has access and all that stuff, then yeah, it makes sense. Maybe you can do an additional control. But again, the point is you're still leaving that vulnerable. Oh, see, the point when I mean vulnerability is not about the, it is having vulnerability. The vulnerability is tampering of images. When I mean vulnerability, it means tampering of images. Say I have 100 images in my registry. What if someone tampers it? And when I do a Docker pull, I'll actually be getting the tampered image itself. But if I do Docker content trust, it says me that you are getting a tampered image. It's not the original image that you actually have to get. Sure. Yeah, I got you. Yes, uh, as you said, like if it's a like very strict, isolated environment and all that, maybe yeah. But again, as I said, I iterate the same point. You're keeping it vulnerable and you're doing an additional workaround stuff. Okay, so I think we just have 20 minutes left. Let me come to this container runtime security segment at the end. Let me just cover the other part so that we can cover the runtime security at the end. So I'll have very little time, so I'll be covering a little quick. And the diamond itself, how do we actually secure the diamond? Is enable the user namespaces itself. What do user namespaces do is like a root inside a container will not be a root outside the container. So by default, if you don't enable the user namespaces, a root inside the container will be root outside the container. And that is the violation of uh, list privilege principle. So you actually need to enable uh, user namespaces. So it's not enabled by default. OK. So you need to do that. And other thing is the disable communication between containers. So by default, each container can communicate to the other container. Containers means isolation. And you definitely don't want to do that. So there, there is an option of how you can uh, 
uh, when I mean communication, it's like a port. So I open a port and then I do a netcat to that particular port from other container. So all sorts of communication between these containers is possible. So you have to do that uh, by changing a flag which disallows communication between containers. So these are all the weak uh, security defaults that I would say. And uh, the one more important thing is like the communication between the client and the daimer itself. By default, it's not secure. As I said, in an enterprise level, people will have client on one machine and diamond on other machine. The entire communication over there is not secure. So you have to do a CA level authentication and a TLS level encryption so that the communication between the client and the diamond itself is secure. So that if I send a Docker pull XYZ, someone in the network will not be able to tamper and change it to Docker pull AVC. So if you do these kind of security things, you'll not be vulnerable to that stuff or else you are vulnerable uh, to all these uh, kind of attacks. So uh, U limits is one very good, uh, nice control that you can find. U limits is something like uh, where you'll see uh, the number of files that a particular container can open, the number of processes that a particular container can spin, the number of uh, process IDs that a particular container can have. All these kind of controls you can actually uh, set up uh, while uh, at the diamond level itself. So by default, there are no U limits. These are the additional security controls that you can uh, employ in your uh, container ecosystem so that you can make it more secure. Yeah, and authorization plugin. So by default, uh, uh, everyone who is having access to Docker Diamond, you know Diamond is the more core security part. If anyone is having access to Diamond, that means Diamond itself is like, you're having the entire access to Diamond. So thanks to Twistlock who made this authorization plugins uh, open source. Using these authorization plugins, what you can do is like, I have an XYZ user, ABC user, uh, PQZ user or something. So I can say XYZ user will be able to do only these particular operations on Diamond. ABC will be able to do only these things. So it provides a fine-grained access control to Diamond authorization plugins. That will definitely be useful at uh, enterprise level. Again, this is not enabled by default. You need to do that. And uh, as you know, Docker Diamond, if you're having access to, you're actually having equal root privileges. So you should definitely add only trusted users to Docker Diamond. So this comes to the more about uh, the Docker Diamond security itself. And coming to the host, one very important thing is you uh, should definitely concentrate more on hardening your host where you're putting your containers. Because someday, so uh, as you know, Docker security and container security is quite evolving so much. People are working so much on that, exploits are keep coming up and all that. So if somehow containers, uh, uh, one container is able to break out and then jump onto host, you still want to prevent a lot of exploits like say buffer overflow or ROP or all these kind of memory exploitation attacks and all that. So there are like kernel hardening techniques like GRX, uh, PAGs and all that, GRSEC and PAGs and all that stuff, which if you apply on uh, the host machines where you are uh, deploying your containers will provide a, an additional uh, security to you so that if someday, if even someone is able to break out of the container, he or she will not be able to do any malicious things on the host. So that's one thing. And uh, also, uh, I think the first point is about managing up-to-date up profile. I didn't actually see that. So up-to-date kernel is definitely needed because it will not have any vulnerabilities. And few security controls that is something like PID C group, which you'll be seeing in the container runtime, will be enabled or enabled only in the latest versions of kernel. So C, uh, PID C group, which will prevent fork bombs in containers is enabled uh, or is available only for kernel versions greater than 4.3. So you should always ensure that and you have to do general uh, uh, things up to date and hardening guidelines and all that stuff. So we have 15 more minutes left. Uh, and coming to the pipeline, the entire view, if you actually see, let me just come here. We dealt about the host security and how we can compromise the host or how we can actually secure it. If you don't do these kind of GRSEC or PACS kind of controls, you are actually allowing and one day when a container was able to break out to do malicious activities on your uh, host machine. So this is about the host security. And we talked about this saying that it's not encrypted or authenticated. Yeah, it's not encrypted or authenticated and you have to be very careful about uh, doing authentication and TLS based uh, thing uh, here.
and then we talked about uh, the diamond security containers is one thing we'll deal about images we talked about and even this this is not uh, secured by default we have to ensure this registry security is what we'll not be dealing for today so this is the entire pipeline view and before i just jump on to the container runtime part i'll just quickly uh, take out through the few things few tips for the enterprises so these are very crucial uh, tips that every enterprise who are deploying docker container system has to take care of so i'll just uh, maybe quickly go through uh, the secure and ready to consume images are the ones that i said are uh, all about uh, how we uh, take care like uh, the writing docker files and enabling docker content rest and all that stuff and you have to customize your seccom of op armor profiles as per your organizational requirements do not just use the uh, default ones uh, change them and use it as per your organizational requirements and do not share secrets in environment variables one thing being that if you do it in docker files it's visible and other thing is like if you link containers using the legacy linking method the environment variables in container in one container are visible to the uh, to the other container so never use environment variables and use tools as such for doing a lot of security stuff and intel is actually uh, actually i think they released already something called uh, the, the the traditional TV, tpm tcb thing for normal machines they have enhanced that to the docker diamond itself so if anyone is doing any changes to docker diamond the container itself will not boot that's kind of very interesting work so optimization techniques and specific rules that you have to create in siem group containers on vm and all, uh, all others are like uh, generic things and so uh this uh the the prediction about uh, the container future actually so uh, hardware level isolation this is my just my opinion there is no references or something so hardware level isolation is one thing so what they are doing is like intel is doing a clear containers concept they are not actually the namespace c group containers but they are lightweight vms so they are able to get close performance as docker docker but with additional security of vm so they're using combination of uh, kmu and kvm and all that stuff and the other future things or just my predictions we should not have no more shared kernel in uh, clear containers and we should have trusted places for getting images maybe like docker store and advanced security tools and inbuilt proper hardening of host when you install the docker itself the host should be hardened with grsec or uh, pax kind of stuff and docker images uh, encryption the same way how we are doing it for uh, vm and the same thing uh, uh, portability between and other just like uh, stuff so these are just my rest plans for what i'm going to do uh, for the next uh, few days i'm much going to work on uh, <coughs> hardware level isolation and all that stuff so i think i have 10 more minutes so what i'm going to do now is just like 5 minutes i'm going to cover how much ever i can do the container runtime segment and the last 5 minutes we'll leave for uh, any questions that uh, we have okay sorry for the way i'm going uh, front and back but it's all about i want to ensure that you guys get the most out of everything so that you can concentrate uh, uh you have the resources so that you can go out and explore more on that so within 5 minutes i'll just quickly wind up this and then the other 5 minutes for questions and uh don't worry about the 5 minutes for the question i'll be around here for 30 or one one more hour 30 minutes or one more hour you can just come on and uh, talk to me if you have any questions so the same thing as i said when you do, when you have an image locally if you do a docker pull docker run or anything you get the local copy first rather than getting the uh updated copy over there so that's one thing you should be very careful about uh, while you're uh, pulling the image running an image or anything and pidc group is one thing that i was talking about by default in a container so say something like i have a hacking competition and i'm giving one container to each one and i do not employ any pidc group limit on that a guy over there with a simple script for fork bomb he can just click that and he can crash the entire machine so you have to do a pidc group limit say something like only this number of processes forking is allowed in a container that you have to do that or else the container will uh, entirely so default docker zero bridge is vulnerable to arp spoofing because you have all of the containers on the same network so you should be using user defined networks and uh, memory limits per container or like by default each container has unlimited memory of the entire host 
So the same way as I said, if you don't set any memory limits, a guy who is having a container access will be able to uh, dodge the entire machine. So you have to set the memory limits per container manually and do not use the privileged containers because it has additional a lot of uh, uh, functionalities that it can do. And uh, incoming traffic, it's not that important. And then, uh, so do not share these uh, namespaces of host with the containers because you uh, containers will have access to see what they are doing and everything. So it's kind of an information disclosure stuff. And then do not disable uh, capabilities. Well, not much stuff. So uh, as I have four more minutes, I'll try just talk about capabilities. So system is a capability which is disabled by default. But if you are trying to enable it, you have to be aware that uh, system capability is not namespaced. So if you change a time in the container, and the time will be changed on the host machine also. It will be very crucial security problem when the host machine is used for update mechanisms or any clock synchronizing mechanisms and all that stuff. And no additional privileges is something. And seccom profiles is very crucial. Seccom profiles enables you to sandbox a particular container in its own environment. So say something like, I have a container, and say that seccom profile is nothing but it has system calls which are actually blocked. So there is a, a presentation at uh, CanSequest 2016, I think, where they found a vulnerable system call, and based on which they are able to exploit that and get out of the container. So if you are not blocking system calls properly, if there is a vulnerable system call, people can jump, uh, break out of the container and then uh, get out. So seccom profiles are very crucial. You have to not just use the default ones. Default ones have like 44 blocked or something. I don't exactly remember. 133 allowed and other things are blocked. So you have to customize this. There have been active research at CMU, few people are doing. Uh, at Silicon Valley campus, what they're doing is like they're analyzing individual system calls and trying to figure out uh, what kind of vulnerabilities can uh, each of the system call have so that they can create a foolproof SECOM profile list. So that's uh, one area that you might have to concentrate. And CPU shares is also other, th other thing. By default, no CPU shares are uh, set for any containers. So CPU shares work on a relative weighing basis. And App Armor or SC Linux or uh, additional defense in-depth strategies where they allow you to sandbox uh, the entire container and access control uh, mechanisms. And mounts are oh, not that important. And then, yeah, you have to be very careful about uh, the non-namespaced components. Uh, there are few names, uh, non-namespaced components like kernel keying and then uh, slash proc. And there are also like system capability that I was saying about. If you're using those, you have to be very careful, like one container is having access to those. Uh, I mean, if a container is using them, say something like a kernel keying. If a container X is using kernel keying operations, other container will be able to see them because they are not namespaced. So you have to be very careful about these uh, non-namespaced things. So that's it. I think I did wind up uh, really quick, but I gave you the proper resources where you can uh, go ahead and see. So. I think we pretty much covered about uh, everything, maybe what we need about uh, the entire uh, the pipeline itself, what security is that. I'm planning to write a white paper, or else maybe I have a few publishers who approached me on writing a book. So I'm thinking about putting all my research findings into that white paper, or else a book, pretty soon. And I'll update you guys if I get a chance to do that. I don't get time to do all this stuff at uh, CMU, at least. So. This is much about the entire presentation. Now we have five more minutes left. So you can ask any questions that you have in this five minutes. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, are, um, are all of the non-namespace components protected by the default tech, uh, profile? Yeah, I would say one thing, name uh, kernel keying is one thing non-namespace that I said. Default seccom profile blocks all of them. But as I said, people start using, customizing their own seccom profiles. And they have to be very aware that, OK, if they allow this, these are the implications. So yeah, most of them are blocked. System capability is also blocked by default. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, 
I didn't actually get your point. So you mean uh, if a particular image is saying like a compliant to CIS Docker 1.12 benchmark, can I trust it or no? Right. So there is. Yeah, the. Correct. Got it. And then, so, if first, is there a trustworthy way to certify an image to be, you know, compliant? And then, two, if there is, then can we just no. CIS is just an uh, reference thing so that people can refer it and customize it as per their uh, own internal uh, requirements. So, uh, in fact, I have done the same thing at uh, Adobe. So, even though I wrote the CIS benchmark part, co authored with it, I, wrote, I still wrote an internal uh, requirement thing. So, each organization has their own internal requirements. So, based on that, we have to tune that. And it, no, CIS do not have any certification thing or something. But yes, all the guidelines that we think like these are the ones that images should follow and all that stuff, we definitely keep everything in the CIS benchmark. There are a few things we couldn't keep in CIS benchmark, say something like use Gosu instead of sudo, because it's more or like, like Linux best practice, not a Docker best practice. So you have other things which you also have to take care of rather than that. But to answer your answer, to answer your question shortly, there is no standard certification process. Yes, yes, yes. Can you share the slide Yeah, of course, sure. I, I'll send it to them. Yes. Have you looked at any of uh, the mechanisms being used uh, in Microsoft's containerization uh, in server 2016? No, no. So actually, if you have seen uh, my uh, future plans, you can see exploring other container technologies. So few things that are on top of my head currently that I want to explore more are uh, Mesos, Mesos containers. And uh, I heard like Mesos containers are kind of more secure than uh, Docker. But I just heard it. I didn't work on it. And Mesos, Rocket are the two things that I want to explore first. And then after that, maybe I'll shift on to the Windows container segment. Anything else? All right. If you don't have anything else, and if you want to talk to me personally, I'll be around here for some time. You can just come out and uh, talk to me. I also have my, yeah, just a minute.